Jeremiah. And uh, I'm going to try to skip the recap. We have a lot to cover this morning. So open your Bibles, please, to the book of Nehemiah, chapter number 3. And uh, we, we've, we've been covering Nehemiah, and we saw at the very beginning when we started our very first study about the conditions in Israel, and he asked about the Jews, he asked about Jerusalem and the displacement of the Jews, his people, and the torn down walls of Jerusalem. Then we saw that he communed with God, we saw that he wept and he cried, he prayed much, he fasted, and was really heartbroken and carried the burdens of his people and the condition of Jerusalem. Then we saw he had a commission for Nehemiah that he went to the king, he's the king's cupbearer, we saw that he he, he asked the king, and the king not only said, yes, you're relieved of your duties. Yes, you can go back and build the walls of Jerusalem. Here's uh, some letters that you can take with you as you travel through the provinces like a passport. Here's some armies, and here's all that you need. So he was able to get the timber off the, the king's forest land and to go help build the, the city back up. Then we saw he commenced the journey. He, he, he left with all that in hand, and we saw the some of the opposition he he encountered there was a couple of fellows, uh, uh, Tobiah, uh, Meshem. Uh, there was another fellow named um, Shalot. I think I said his name right. And uh, we're going to see some of those guys again. And then today we're going into the constructing of the walls. How he const- um, he's starting to build the walls. And we're in Nehemiah chapter number three, and I've broken this down in your handout. You'll you'll see two pages in your handout. Now remember, these handouts that you see uh, is strictly just to help you follow along. And and I'll tell you this, and and don't be insulted by this. This is the same for children as it is for adults. We learn in several different ways. And one of the ways that we learn is by writing. The other way we learn is by hearing. The other way we learn is by seeing. But there's a fourth one. Seeing and writing is really falls in the same category. It's one's called kinesthetics, and then we learn by emotions. And so all of those things, so that's what that's there for. If you save them and study later, great. If you throw them away, that's fine. It's just to help you in today's class to follow along. That's what they're intended to do. So A, B, and C. A, the labors for the walls. Let's look at Nehemiah chapter number 3. Now, I'm not going to read all of Nehemiah chapter 3, and I'm going to tell you why in just a moment. Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priest, and they builded the sheep gate. They sanctified it and set up the doors of it, even unto the tower of Mea. They sanctified it unto the tower of Hananiel. Now, we're not going to go into the towers too much, but I'm going to stop right there. Because what we're seeing is a construction of the walls. It's time for him to construct the walls. And the handout that you have is, when we get to that, which is the end of today's lesson, We're going to go around the wall and see what he did. What he did in this very first verse was they made and built the sheep gate. And they went around and they corrected all the gates and built, started building the walls. Um, There is a record here of all the laborers that are working here and building these walls. And I want us to start out by this. There's the catalog of laborers. If you read the Bible here in Nehemiah chapter 3, he catalogs all these laborers as they build each of these gates. There's 38 individual people are identified as laborers uh, here in the scriptures. So when anytime that you see certain people identified, they're usually the ones that are in charge. They're like foremen of the project. You guys are in charge of the fish gate. You guys are in charge of the horse gate. You guys are in charge of Uh, the water gate or the fountain gate. Uh, There's all these different gates. We're going to see there's 12 gates, but he only identifies 10 gates that they built around. So in order to see the individuals listed here, we find out that there's 15 different groups identified. In verse number one, there's a group of priests. In verse number three, there's the sons of Hassaniah. In verse number five, there's the Tekoites. Verse number seven, there's the men of Gibeon and there's others. So there's many people involved in this. Nehemiah cannot do this by himself. The pastor cannot run this church by himself. Nobody can do anything by themselves. It takes a group effort. What we see here is a group effort. The laborers are identified. The work has been farmed out. There's a foreman for this job and a foreman for that job and a foreman for this job. 
And that's how it gets done. And Nehemiah is managing that. He, he's not necessarily building all the walls. He's managing the groups and they're reporting in there. And they're getting things done. That's how those walls got built. In how many days? 52. It's on the test. 52 days. 52 days. Human nature being what it is, though, some folks, they get upset when their name's not on this list. That's just how folks know. Their name's not on the list. They want to be identified. They get upset when their name's not in the church bulletin. How come I wasn't identified? God knows all about it. And uh, great is that reward that God knows. So it doesn't always have to be in the bulletin or has to be mentioned from pulpits. And folks do get really bent out of shape and they'll leave churches because of it. Uh, I want to be recognized. And we lose the point of why we were even doing what we were doing. These individuals were in charge of getting these jobs done. So there's a whole catalog of laborers and there's a communication of the laborers. We'll see uh, that just by listing their names is a commendation of itself. That they must have done a good job. It's likely that these who, uh, just like the, we, we just had the 4th of July. Those men the, who signed the Declaration of Independence, all of you know about the Declaration of Independence and what it meant to sign the Declaration of Independence to come against England was as if they're already declaring war. They knew it was an act of treason to come against their own government. These guys were brave enough to do what they did. It's the same thing with these guys. Uh, they're, they're coming together and they knew what was right to do. Uh, today, you know, whiners, sluggards, draft dodgers, uh, they never make a great nation and doesn't make a great church. Uh, so it's time to sometimes we have to roll up our sleeves and get to it. These gallant men, they live by faith and they did what they knew they had to do and to build these walls up. Not only was there a communication with these laborers, but there's a cooperation of the laborers. Those men that were listed had to cooperate in order to get it to, in order to get it done. One person cannot be expected to do it all. And we know that uh, we must all work together. Zechariah, uh, no, uh, Nehemiah, chapter two, verse number eighteen. They said this: "Let us rise up and build." We learned that in a, a last chapter. Let us rise up and build. They were ready for the task. So they were ready, uh, and there was cooperation with them. He wasn't forcing them to. The communities of the laborers are listed here, too, and I'm not going to go through all the communities. This just goes to show how much of a concerted effort it was. It's not just Jerusalem. Jerusalem wasn't just... It, you always think, well, Jerusalem, well, of course you're going to build the walls. Of course you're going to build the gate. You live here. But it's not. Listen, in, the, in verse number 2, chapter 3, verse number 2, we see that Jericho's helping out. Verse number five, Tekoa is helping out. Gibeon's helping out in verse seven. Zenoa in 13. Beth Hakarim in verse number 14. Mizpah, Beth Zur, Kayla in 17 and 18. Lots of communities around Jerusalem are helping build the walls. So it's not always. So somebody asks for help from our church to another church about some, some need that they have and we're able to help them. We should be able to help them. Same with them helping us. We help each other. And that's what they're doing here. I think the Amish have that kind of, that, they got that part wrapped up pretty good, don't they? They do a barn raising. They build a house. And they just get together as a community. I may never step foot in that barn. Probably will, visiting and other things. That barn's for you, but I'm helping you. That's how we're to help each other. And that's what they're doing here. So we see the Nehemiah, the great wall builder. We envision him going out there and leading them together. But it wasn't just Jerusalem and the Jews. It was everybody around. They were all involved. So there were communities of the laborers. Number five, there was the callings of the laborers. What do you mean by the callings of the laborers? Well, these guys had different vocations. At least seven different vocations are listed here in, in Nehemiah chapter number three. We see priests are mentioned in verses 1, 17, and 22. Goldsmiths. In verses 8 and 31 and 32, apothecaries in verse 8, rulers, there's just tons of verses about the rulers, 9, 12, 14. There's uh, merchants are mentioned in verse 32, water carriers in verse 26, gatekeepers in verse 29. So it's not only, well, I, I don't know anything about that, brother. I can't help you out with the treasury. I, I, don't want, I don't know anything about that. No, we help each other when we're asked. And you know, I said, I don't know how to do that. That's okay. We'll find something for you to do. Because there's always extra, we could always use some extra help. 
And then, and that's kind of what, what we see here. So not only are the individuals and the groups and the communities, but we see people from all different walks of life. And if we look around this room, we'll see all different kinds of people. Folks that were in law enforcement, folks that are uh, uh, computer geniuses, uh, folks that are, are, are whatever. You know, we all have different, what's that? Nurses. Our church is made up of all different people. We come together because God saved us all individually, but now puts us in that group. No matter who you are or how long you've been serving, we all have an obligation to serve the Lord. It doesn't change. I've been serving the Lord for X amount of years. I, I don't need to do that anymore. No, we all have it. We're still here. We have an obligation. Number six, the corruption of the laborers. Now, here's the problem. Here's the problem. Everything looked good, but there's some corruption. Two men are listed here. And it's disappointing, but every work project has them. And we're going to find Eliashib, which is verse number one. We just mentioned him. He's the high priest. He's the last guy that you would think. He's the high priest. Uh, he and another fellow named Meshulam, which we'll, we can read about, uh, they come against Nehemiah. And they were on board at first. They're building the sheep gate. And they're on board, but now they come against Nehemiah. What happened was, Eliashib, the high priest, his granddaughter, married the son of Sanballat. You remember who Sanballat was? I showed you guys a picture of these guys standing here, cartoon characters. Sanballat and Tobiah. Yeah. And they came against him. Remember, he's on his way to Jerusalem. They came against him. And then they... They grabbed another guy and they identified his name, Meshem. So that Sanballat, Sanballat, Eliashib's granddaughter marries the son of Sanballat. So these families are getting together. See what happens when we mix with the wrong groups? And then next thing we know, we got these oppositions. They're laborers who are now coming against Nehemiah and God's work. And every work has it, unfortunately. The Bible says that that he is allied unto Tobiah. Finally, number seven, the coordinating of the laborers. Nehemiah's leadership was superb. He had a lot of organizational skills. He masterfully executed the plan of building the walls and the gates. Listen, great work doesn't just happen. How many times have you ever been to a big event and you say, wow, that went so smooth. You just don't know. They say sometimes to us, you just don't know what it took to make all this take place. A lot of work. I'm going to say this, but don't look for divine miracles when you're charged with doing something. Don't look for divine miracles to happen if you don't organize in your own life, in your own time, and your facets of your life is all disarray. Paul said this. He exhorted this in 1 Corinthians. Let all things be done decently and in order. 1 Corinthians 14.33 says God is not the author of confusion. So when there's mass confusion, God's not in it. So we need to find out what we need to do to fix this thing. Whatever it is, the project that you're working on. Anytime we work for God like this. I don't, I'm not like today. We're doing the 4th of July celebration this evening. I don't know what all is involved. Somebody's cooking something. It's not me. Somebody's setting up bouncy houses or something. It's not me. It takes a lot of effort. Pastor called me and asked me if I would run the cornhole tournament. I said, yeah, but I won't play. I'll just, I'll just run it. Somebody's got to do that. So it takes everybody to do something. I am going to eat something. But I'm not going to cook something. Well, because I'm involved too. I'm doing something. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> the labor on the walls, number B, the letter B, the labor on the walls. Those were the laborers. What labor was being done? Three words are used in Scripture to describe the labor that they do. Now, I apologize that I'm not going to read through Nehemiah 3. You read Nehemiah 3 on your own and you're going to see something. And I wrote it in your handouts that it may seem monotonous. It may seem repetitive. It may seem even boring to you. But the person who is a student of the scriptures 
And, and they learn you, there's so much in there that, that you don't think that's there. It's like so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so. It's that type of thing. But there's a lot happening in here. And I want you to be able to see that. It tells us the extent of the labor. Their description is extensive. They built, they fortified, and they repaired. Those are the three words Scripture talks about. They built, they fortified, that means they reinforced it, and they repaired things that were already there. Not only was the uh, description of the labor, it's on your screen there, the description of the labor, but I want to look at the design of the labor. Twice in verse 1, we see the word sanctified. Sanctified. We see the priest, according to the verses in verse 1, builded the sheep gate and then sanctified it. It indicates they did what they did to honor God. They sanctified it. What does the word sanctify mean? Most of you should know what Sanka coffee is. Anybody remember Sanka? Do you guys remember Sanka? It was more popular in the 70s and 80s. Sanka was a dehydrated coffee that was decaffeinated. That was their big sell. It was decaffeinated. They got the word Sanka from the French word means sans, which means to be free of, to be separated from caffeine. And that's where they got the word Sanka. It's a play off the word sans, sans free or sans, sans fay, which is French. It means to be separated from. Where we get our word sanctified to be separated. So the sheep gate was to be separate from everything else. And we're going to talk about the sheep gate in just a minute. These guys sanctified it. They set it apart. They called it to, they called it to be used for nothing else but that. So we see not only the design of the labor is very specific to a lot of things. They didn't do what they did to honor, to get their name honored among men. They did it to honor God. That's why they sanctified it. But the dedication of the labor, they added to their labor. The Bible says six times that they did another, another piece. That means that when they finished whatever assigned work that they were on, they asked, how can I help now? They were being proactive. That, that bothers me a lot of time in the secular world where we're all given jobs to do and you finish the job that you have to do so that I see a co-worker go over there and sit down and take a break while the rest of us are working. Buddy, you need to come over and say, man, can let me, I finished what I'm doing. Let me help you guys finish so we can take a break together. But they, that's what they did here. And the Bible tells us at least six times it's, it's mentioned. When they finished their work, they went around and said, let me help you with that. Let me help you with that. And then you two get together. Let me help y'all with that. That's how we, that's how, that's why they built that wall in 52 days. 52 days. It was amazing. They had dedication in what they were doing. Paul says this in Galatians 4.18, it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. In verse number 20, we see a, a gentleman by the name of Baruch. He worked, according to the scriptures, listen, earnestly. So whatever you put your hand to, Luke chapter number 9, verse number 32 says, who, who, any man who put his hand to the plow, see what, what that verse is talking about, you put your hand to the plow, you put your hand to a work, you put your hand to the ministry of the Lord, whether it's the treasury or teaching or what have you, 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 you do that work. Because not always you feel like getting up on Sundays and coming. Especially if you had a hard, hard work week, you work late, you couldn't sleep last night. But you come, you shower up, you get refreshed. I always get refreshed. We put our hand to a work. Verse number five. The Tekoites. The Tekoites is the city of Tekoa. Their nobles and the rulers were proud and they were lazy. And there are always some like that. So don't think that everybody that was showing up to help Nehemiah and get these walls up. Not everybody did their pulled their fair share. The nobles thought they were above it. And they were just lazy. But they showed up. How many people show up for work but they never really do any work? We're having a work day at the church and you'll see them walk around with coffee and shoot the breeze and talk about something. But You know, I never saw that guy do any work. I don't think his hand ever held a rake. There's folks like that. They show up but they don't do it. That's what these guys are doing. Okay, we're going to use our handout, I mean our, our maps. 
All right, these are the what, what you see here on your map, on your handout. This is the old walls of Jerusalem. When he came to build the wall back up, it's not like he was building all the outer wall. He built this wall here. Kind of looks like the state of Florida. Right? A little bit. Because it comes down to a point. And I want us to go through some of these uh, reconstructions that he does. First, we're going to start. Whoops. First, we're going to start with the sheep gate. And that's found in verse number one. Oh, there it is. Sheep gate. Nehemiah chapter 3, verse number 1. It's way up here. On your handout, you can write sheet gate in there. And if you get lost on page number 2, I've got this number up here. It says one sheet gate, and I've labeled it one on your handout so you can just, so it's on there in case you, you lose, lose track. The sheet gate was used, the temple was right here. This is where the temple is. I'm going to show you a picture later of a drawing. Uh, oh, um, constru yeah, construction, constructing the walls. I might not have a C. I might not have a C. Let me see. Uh, that's a good question. I don't have a handout. You got a handout? Oh, the construction of the walls. Yeah, the constructing of the walls. That's what that one is. Constructing the constructing of the walls. Sorry about that. So this was the sheet gate. Now, what I was getting at was this right here. Let me use this. Let me use this laser pointer. Right here is right here. You'll see this right here is where the uh, the temple's located, and so they they put the sheet gate right here close to it because the sheep were brought in for the sacrifice. So that was the first one. That's why it was sanctified. It was set apart. It was a special place. We see that Jesus Christ is named uh, named that, and we see that when the building of the wall start, he's going to do this right here. This is what you're going to see. I'm going to use my pointer again. There it is, way up there. He's going to start there at the sheep gate, go all the way down like this, and we're going to go we're going to go all the way down to the bottom if I can get it down there, and then we're going to come up on the right hand side, and that's where he's going to end it at the sheep gate. He starts at the sheep gate and he ends at the sheep gate. Jesus said in Revelation, he says, I am Alpha, not I am the Alpha. He says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Your life starts when you get saved. Right? And it, the best part is it doesn't end. It might end on this planet in the current body that we're in because we'll be back, but not in this body. So everything starts and ends with the sheep gate. I thought that was rather fascinating. Then we, we move to our left a little bit. We see the fish gate. The fish were coming in from the Mediterranean and the Sea of Galilee. I'm not making that up. I'm not just saying that because that's where some of the bodies of water are. Scripture tells me that. It says that's where they brought them in from. It tells us that, that fish are mentioned four times in the Bible. And the last mention of the fish gate is in Zephaniah 1 verse 10. It's a, and in Zephaniah chapter 1 verse number 10, that last mention of the fish gate in the Scriptures... It's associated with judgment upon Israel because of their sin. Many lives are like that. It'll be the last time that we ever have to deal with it, and it's this judgment. It's judgment upon, upon folks' lives. But that's where the fish gate was located. That was the second piece that was built. In verse number, that was verse number three. In verse number six, we see the old gate. Sometimes known as the corner gate, found in 2 Kings. In 2 Kings, it talks, it calls that old gate the corner gate. It's one of the first gates in the city and Jeremiah 6.16 says old paths where is the good way? There's old paths where is the good way? I think this is just me talking I think that we need to go back to a lot of the old ways if you look at modern day culture and no offense to any generation in this room or any generation that's represented in the church but the old ways are, I, I like the old ways better than I like the new ways I thought etiquette was better. I thought if you look at a black and white movie and they showed you a picture of a group of people and the fellows are wearing hats and ties, the ladies are wearing dresses, and then they back off and you think they're somewhere special, they're at a baseball game. Yeah. <laughs> I saw I saw I was like, look at that, all the people, guys wore I know it's a TV show, but it was a lot like this. When uh, Ward Cleaver, I'll leave it to Beaver, somebody ring the doorbell, he'd get up and says, 
That dude's always in a shirt and tie and a sweater. <laughs> Reading the paper, having a cup of coffee. Yeah. But people try, but people try, but it's not like that today. I'm as guilty as the next guy. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm get, if somebody rings our doorbell, knocks on our door, back in the old day, yeah, come on in, it's unlocked. Well, that's what we used to do. Come on in, it's unlocked. If I did that now, one, I don't know who I'm going to get. And two, I don't want to see me standing there in my short, my short, um, pajama shorts. Because I, I walk around in barefooted or in socks. I, I don't have a tie on. I mean, that's just what our culture's changed. Okay. I, it's funny, but I'm saying all that to say this. I'm saying all that to say this. It's true. We need to go back to the old paths of morality and godliness. I'm afraid that today society forgot where we come from. We could use some of that good etiquette. We could use some of that good etiquette. But that was the, that was the old... In case y'all didn't know, I don't know how long y'all know Pastor Brandon. He sang in a quartet called the, anybody know? I know, you probably know. Old Pathways Quartet. I used to love going to the nursing homes and different places to listen to those fellas sing. Churches. Old path. We got some of their CDs. Old Pathways Quartet. We need to go back to some of the Old Pathways Quartet. Oh my goodness. Okay, gate number four was the Valley Gate. Not Valley Girl. Valley Gate, because it was an access to the valley right here, the, the Hinnom Valley, which is right here, and that's why they called it the, the Valley Gate. Uh, it, it, let, it had access there. Uh, this is where Nehemiah begins his nighttime inspection of the wall. Remember we covered that last week or a week before? He went in the, in the cover of darkness and began inspecting the walls to see how tore down they were because he didn't want anybody to know that that's what he was up to. So he started right here at the valley gate as he made his way around inspecting the walls. Often in life, we go through valley gates. What's the valley gate in our life? Trials, tribulations, hardships, deaths in family, a fuss or a feud with a friend or a spouse, arguments over things, things that bother us, things that will not stop. That's the valley gate. And, uh, and there's always hope because the Lord's always there. He's, he's, he's never left us, and nor he did he forsake us. In verse number 14, we see they build the dung gate. The dung gate. The dung gate, don't think of it as what you might think. The word dung gate really means more of it's the, uh, the garbage chute of the city. It's where the garbage was taken out, the refuse was taken out. Matter of fact, these are actual photographs, by the way. I'm not just showing some pictures. These are actual photographs. And on the wall there in Jerusalem, it actually says, it's translated in English, Dung Gate. The Dung Gate, Christ referred to the Dung Gate outside of Jerusalem. And it was a dump, by the way. It was just a dump. That's where they dumped everything. And Jesus referred to it in Mark chapter 9, verse number 43, as a fire that's, uh, that is not quenched. It's, he refers to it as hell. Gehenna specifically. Next, as we move up to the right side, number six out of the ten was the fountain gate. It's mentioned here in verse number 15. But the gate of the fountain repaired Shalon, the son of Kol Hase, the ruler of part of Mizpah. He built it. The fountain gate is in the vicinity of the Enrajel Springs. It was a, it was a fountain there. And the fountain always symbolized life. Listen to Jeremiah chapter 2, 13. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Life is not found in sinful activities. The world thinks that it can be, but it's not. That's not where happiness is found. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. John 7, 37, Jesus said. So the fountain gate is that place that uh, near, the, the, near the, the, the springs. That's why they named it that. As we move up a little bit further, we'll see as we get to number, what is it, seven? The water gate. Of course, has nothing to do with Nixon. But the water gate, found in verse number 26, is in the vicinity of the I don't know if I ever say this. I never got it right. G-I-H-O-N. The Gihon or Gihon or Jihon Springs. 
It was a spring. There was another place where you could get water. And so, you know, water was great to have in. It's always hard to get fresh water. Here's a picture of it. And uh, uh, it, was, it was just another water source. And it, it's not said to have been repaired. The scriptures don't tell us that it was repaired. So it may be one of the ones that, that it didn't need it. It makes us think about the living water, the word of God. That's what I thought of when I'm reading this. I'm thinking, they didn't repair that gate? And it's a water gate? And God's the living water, the word of God? This is the only word I need. I don't need to repair this Bible. I don't need an NIV. I don't need some other translation. I don't need some version. I don't need the, the Queen James Bible. And that, that's a perversion of the Word of God right there. If you've never seen it, it's all white. It's got a rainbow on the front of it. It's called the Queen James Version for LGBTQs. I don't need it. It's, it does not need to be repaired. This one did not. The Bible doesn't tell us they repaired it. Interesting, isn't it? I thought it was. A horse gate, verse number 28. This is intriguing to me, the horse gate. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 16, if you know anything about scriptures, you'll, you'll, you'll recognize this. The kings were not to, quote unquote, multiply horses to himself. They were not supposed to multiply horses to themselves and rise above the people and be all pomp and, and I'm better than everybody. Uh -uh. It, so it was forbidden. But Solomon, he ignored all that. He did. In 1 Kings 10, 28, listen to this. Quote, Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt. Not only did he do it and ignore God, they, they named a gate after him. We're going we're gonna to call this gate the horse gate. I'd be scared to death. That's like having a special refrigerator in my, in my garage, and I do, and it's full of soda pop. All different kinds of soda pop. And guests come over and says, go on and open that convenience store, and you'll see all these sodas of all different kinds of Junk I don't even drink. But when we have friends over, they have it. There's a Yoo-Hoo, and I can't drink Yoo-Hoo. I'm a diabetic. I shouldn't be drinking that. I got drink. But I don't have a refrigerator dedicated to beer. And if I did have beer in my house, I'd hide it behind something. Here's the bowl. They're not hiding it. <laughs> they, here's the horse gate. And we're going to call it the horse gate. We're not hiding anything. I thought that ironic. We have horse gates today that should be forbidden. Just like that one, homosexuality gets privileges instead of punishment. We don't call it abortion. We call it family planning. That's our horse gate. Gambling and lotteries, nah, it's an educational lottery. It's okay. We don't call it alcohol. We call it their spirits. Would you enjoy some spirits, sir? Change the name all you want to, but it's forbidden. Number nine and ten, and we're almost done. Number nine is the east gate. And it's going to end great. I hope you love the ending. Well, we're, we're basically there. This is the east gate. And obviously it's on the east side, as you can see. But if you see the picture real closely, and if you've never seen this picture before, you can go online and look at it. If you see right there the gate entrance, you see what it is? It's all boarded up. Should I say bricked over. They want to do what they can to stop Jesus from coming in because this is the gate that Jesus is going to be coming into when he comes back. And if you see up here, that's because that's where the temple is. Yeah. He's going to come up into Jerusalem into the temple. It goes straight into the temple. Acts chapter 3 verse 10 calls it the same gate. They call it the beautiful gate. I can see why. You see Jesus coming in that gate? I don't know how it's going to bust up. I don't know if Jesus is just going to raise his hands and they just burst out. I don't know if they're going to have a battle and knock it down. I just know that that's how he's getting in. And, it, they, and, and some call it the golden gate, not the bridge. They call that the golden gate, the beautiful gate. It's known as the east gate in, in Nehemiah chapter number 3. This is the same gate that Christ entered in Palm Sunday. He will enter in, in, in again through it on his return. Ezekiel prophesied. Listen to what Ezekiel said. He said it would be closed. That, these, that this gate will be closed up. There's today's picture. It's closed up. And Ezekiel, before Jesus ever showed up, Ezekiel prophesied that it'd be closed. And sure enough, it is. Satan's doing everything he can to try to stop God. He's trying to stop God in your life. He's trying to stop God in this church. And everything that we do, Satan's trying to stop. He thinks he can stop Jesus from coming in. Are you kidding? Are you kidding? Really? Finally, the last gate that's mentioned. This one goes by different names. The Mithkad Gate, 
also known as the muster gate or the inspection gate. Uh, military fellows, you'd know what this is when it's time to muster. All right? It was time to count the troops, inspect the troops, make sure everybody's there. And sometimes called the inspection gate. That's where they gathered the groups together. It was, a, it was also known as a people gate. And what they did was, was a place of inspection. It reminds us that God will review our lives. He will inspect us. Whether you're saved or whether you're lost, God will review your life. Either you're going through the great white throne of judgment because you're lost and He's reviewing whether or not you accepted Christ or not, or you're saved and you're going through the judgment seat to see what you've done in your life. And all that we've done is either classified in six things. Let's do it like this. Everything that we do in our life is classified in six, in three different places on each side. Either silver, gold, or precious gems, hay, wood, and stubble. Yeah. What we do for God or what we don't do for God. What we do for ourselves, what we do for our own glory. Whether we do it for the Lord or we do it not for the Lord. These are the gates. This is an artist's rendition of the city. Now I'll take a look at what the temple looks like. Look how big that temple is. You can't see the sheep gate. It's right there on the other side there. There's the east gate right there where I'm pointing there. Way down here is the dung gate and the valley gate. So you can see how it comes together. And then you can see some of the lines of the old wall of Jerusalem as he was building this wall. I'm going to end it with this. U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Well, I'm not really going to quite end it. I'm almost going to end it with this. And we're done. How many pictures came up? It shouldn't have been that many at one time. It should have been one. That one. If the others come up all by themselves, they do. Okay. United States of America, we have different ports of entries, as you can see. I've been to most of them. I've been to the southern border. I've been to the northern border. I've been to the I've been to where we have problems in Florida, and you know we're living in Alaska and controlled some of the borders over here for uh, the Russian fisheries coming in. So I had a chance to see the borders. We've created the T. What is that? The TSA, Transportation Safety Administration or Security or whatever, right? We have passports. You have to have you have to be an American citizen to get an American passport. We're doing our best before our current administration to secure our borders. We want to know who's coming, who's going. There's always going to be somebody sneaking in Jerusalem. Sneaking in. You know, there's always, no matter who's in charge, somebody's going to sneak somewhere. People sneak out of prisons and sneak into prisons. If they can do that, surely they're, they're going to do what they do here. But we try to control our borders. All the nations do. Jerusalem is trying to control their border. Where are we going with all this? What's today's study have to do? You ready? It's this. The body of Christ. Here's your borders. There's your gates. All these are your gates. If you're not putting borders up and walls up, the devil's going to infiltrate you with pornography, nudies, or whatever. Bad language or listening to bad language. Speaking certain things we shouldn't speak or listen to things we ought not to be listening to. Or smelling, inhaling things we shouldn't be inhaling. And vice versa. Or your human body is filled with all kinds of things from whatever we we go to the restroom we have a dung gate because we we eliminate stuff every gate has a purpose that we have and we're to control that there's a big life lesson here in the gates of israel uh, the gates of jerusalem and what was built we need to build ours just like they built the ones in jerusalem let's close in prayer